All right, so we got two wonderful speakers coming up, and if we have time, we're going to have a little bit of questions and answers with them before moving on to the next session. I'm sorry there are no actual breaks this evening. There will be some tomorrow, but we're packing in a lot of wonderful stuff. Uh, our first speaker uh, is one of the most informed and eloquent and engaged people on one of the most pressing and dangerous, but at the same time promising uh, crises facing us right now. Christine Ahn is the founder and international coordinator of Women Cross DMZ. In 2015, she led 30 international women peacemakers, some of them in this room tonight, across the demilitarized zone from North to South Korea. Uh, Christine Ahn is the co-founder of the Korea Policy Institute, the global campaign to save Jeju Island, the national campaign to end the Korean War, and the Korean Peace Network. Welcome, Christine Ahn, to, to No War 2018. Hi. Thanks so much for um, gathering here tonight. And um, I'm a little bit um, out of sorts because I actually left my passport at home. And so I missed my flight last night. And so I, like, scrambled. I must think I'm Canadian or something. So I, I, um, I just got here. So um, please have a little compassion for me because I am not in the zone right now. But I'm so honored to be with you. And it's, um, I just, I can't even thank you enough for the vision that we can and we must end all wars. And I see Anne there in the audience. And. Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> Little smart on the spot guidance. <laughs> um, so I'm. We're just setting up here a little video that I'll show at the end of my presentation. And it's this one. Great. So while it's loading, I can. Okay, great. Great. Thank you for your help. I'm Christine, by the way. Thanks. Um, okay. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the video in just a sec, but I need to read. But is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. This is good. This is how it's gonna be. Okay. All right. So, um, happy International Day of Peace. Woo! What a moment to be de declaring an end to war. And for once in nearly 70 years, the possibility of ending the Korean War is within our grasp. We are in a historic opportunity to end the second decade, Korea, seven decade Korean War. This week, the world witnessed world-class peacemaking by the leaders of North and South Korea. Who watched um, footage from the summit from Pyongyang? Was that amazing? Was that amazing? To an audience in Pyongyang of 150,000 North Koreans standing on their feet and clapping the entire time, wildly cheering, President Moon said, the two leaders solemnly declared to 80 million Koreans and to the entire world, that there would be no more war on the Korean Peninsula and that a new era of peace had opened. I know, we have, this is a victory for us. It's the shining light for peace. It's on the most dangerous situation in the world, right? We should celebrate, yay! Thank you. So let's just think about this for a moment. Who is President Moon, right? He's the president of South Korea, but what do we know about him? His mother was born in the North. Their family fled during the Korean War. This is a man who served in the South Korean military and helped bring peace during a military skirmish between the U.S. and North Korean soldiers at the DMZ. 
He was a human rights lawyer who helped bring down US-backed dictatorship and usher in democracy. Imagine what it must be like for President Moon, who was swept into power by the candlelight revolution of 16 million South Koreans, one in three South Korean, took to the streets in the fall and the winter of 2016 and 17, demanding the impeachment of the corrupt President Park Geun-hye, who was the daughter of the for former dictator Park Chung-hee, who ruled South Korea with an iron fist for 17 years. So think about what it means for him to be swept into power and to resume office of the Blue House at the height of the Trump administration's fire and fury. I mean, just imagine, we're upon the anniversary of the UN General Assembly, and at that meeting, President Trump, what did he say? He threatened to totally destroy a sovereign country. How could you do that in the world's assembly that is supposed to be doing peace and diplomacy? So think about that, about his background, and what it must have been for President Moon to stand in front of 150,000 North Koreans and to have them hear him as the messenger, as the leader of South Korea, saying, I am here representing South Korea, and we are here together, and we are on this journey to end this Korean War. And that Koreans will be the, they will be the masters of their own destiny. And it won't be dictated by the US, it'll be for Korea for Koreans. So, I mean, not only was like the optics of this so amazing, but they made some concrete um, declarations, right, to actually move this process. So they announced a long list of actionable steps to improve relations. Um, just, I mean, listen to some of these. They're gonna establish a reunion center for divided families. Who saw the images last month of the family reunions, right, of, of Koreans in their 70s, of their 80s, of their 90s, who haven't seen their, lo their loved ones, their siblings, their brothers and sisters, their mother. I mean, they are gonna set up a reunion center. I am Korean, I was born in Seoul, but I actually have family from North Korea. Yeah. Yeah, how powerful is this? I mean, for somebody who's been working on this for so long. Okay, they also are gonna reestablish Kaesong. That was the joint industrial complex that was started between North and South Korea during the last um, sunshine era. They're gonna reopen Mount Gumgang. It was a site of tourism. A lot of South Koreans went there. Do you know how many North and South Koreans met during the sunshine era? That was from the mid, um, mid 19 or late 1990s to the mid 2000s? Half a million. We have no idea what happens when a neoconservative administration comes into power and stops that process of reconciliation. What else do they do? The defense ministers, they agreed to reduce military tension. They're gonna downsize the number of guards at the military demarcation line in the DMZ, and they are demining a village in the DMZ. Oh my God, in my wildest dreams, I could have never imagined this moment. And it is here. But the job is not yet done. At the summit, Kim Jong-un pledged to work with Moon Jae-in to make, quote, a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. He also promised to dismantle, in the presence of international inspectors, two symbolic missile and nuclear test sites, which have long drawn the ire of Washington, the Dongchan-ri Intercontinental uh, Missile Launch Pad and the Yongbyon Plutonium Nuclear Reactor. But there's one huge caveat. While North Korea has agreed to dismantle its nuclear program, this would depend on, quote, corresponding measures, end quote, by the United States. In other words, North Korea won't do anything it's not already doing without a trade-off. Action for action. Moon has long said that denuclearization should be the end goal of a peace process. But talks is stalled between Washington and Pyongyang because the Trump administration feels the Kim regime has not done enough 
to um, make progress towards denuclearization. But North Korea is unlikely to unilaterally surrender its nuclear weapons without improved relations. I mean, Kim has seen what happened to Iraq. Kim has seen what happened to Libya. And Kim is now seeing what is happening to Iran, not to mention North Korea's own history of surviving indiscriminate US bombing. Most people don't know that the Korean War never officially ended, or even how the two Koreas were divided. So let me just give you a quick history. Korea was a unified nation for thousands of years, and in 1910, it was colonized by Japan for 35 long years. My parents actually were born and raised in that period. They couldn't uh, speak Korean in schools. They had to take Japanese names. And I mean, my, my mother, whose father was a carpenter, you know, would tell stories of how all the furniture that he would make would just be one day, just like the Japanese authorities would come and just steal and take away all their hard labor. The rice farmers, more than half of their crops were taken by the Japanese. So you can imagine that experience of living under colonization. And then at the end of World War II, when the US defeated Japan by essentially you know, obliterating Nagasaki and Hiroshima with two atomic bombs, um, Korea then becomes the subject of, as, colonial, as a colonial subject. And so what does the United States do? Two United States State Department officials, they take a page, literally, from the National Geographic, and they draw a line across the 38th parallel. And they say, they send a message to Stalin, a memo, and say, you can take north of the 38th, you take Pyongyang, and we'll take Seoul. And that is basically how Korea became divided. There, that was in 1945. So no Korean was consulted, and no Korean wanted the division of their country. So, on June, so basically, in this period of 1945 to 1948, is uh, military governments. And, um, and, you know, the US, I mean, I'll go into this in the Q&A section, but basically repressed the democratic movements that did not want to be under US military occupation. And so I think that's a really important thing to note because I think that we're fed, especially in the United States, we're there to defend South Korean democracy. Well, at many key turning points of the advancement of democracy in South Korea, the US was there to quash it. Um, so on June 25th, 1950, after there was some back and forth military skirmishes between the two, um, the two Korea, sorry, 1948, um, backed by the UN, there were separate elections. So uh, Syngman Rhee became the, basically the US puppet in South Korea, and Kim Il-sung later became the leader of North Korea. And so that's basically how the creation of two separate states began and has still did, been to today. So 1950, June 25th, you know, after skirmishes back and forth across the 38th parallel, North Korea crosses in a bid to unify the country. And so the US went to the UN Security Council to garner support for a US-led coalition, which they called the United Nations Command, which the UN just reaffirmed that it is not the UN, but it is actually a US-led coalition. 16 countries fought in that war on the US side. Canada was one of those countries that fought in that war. In just three years, the Korean War claimed four million lives. The US dropped 635,000 tons of bombs on Korea, more than the entire Asia Pacific theater, and 33,000 tons of napalm, more than that was splattered all over Vietnam. Curtis LeMay, the US Air Force General in the Korean War, he testified to Congress, quote, we burn down just about every city in North Korea and South Korea. We killed off over a million civilian Koreans and drove several million more from their homes, end quote. The US's indiscriminate bombing campaign leveled 80% of North Korean cities, killing one out of every four family members. 
The bombing of homes was so devastating that the regime urged the citizens to build shelter underground. Okay, so on July 27, 1953, the Korean War ended in a stalemate with a ceasefire. That means that war and preparing for war has dictated how Korea has developed. It has dictated the US and Canada and all the other countries that fought in the UN command, its relationship to North Korea. So military commanders from the US, North Korea, and China, they signed the armistice agreement and they promised within 90 days to return to end the Korean War with a peace agreement. 65 years later, we are still waiting for that peace treaty. We are never told that history. Who knows that history? Okay, okay. Well, we are the peace movement, okay? So instead, we get this one-sided story of how evil the North Korean regime is. It is, it is an authoritarian regime, but that it is not the greatest threat to the world. There's no context for why North Korea has even pursued nuclear weapons, or in fact that it was the US that first had nukes in South Korea until George Bush Sr. And it still has 28,500 troops on the southern part of the peninsula preparing for war against North Korea, and until recently has been rehearsing quote unquote decapitation strikes. This is actually the language and the operational plan in the joint exercises to overthrow the North Korean regime. And we know now from Bob Woodward's new book, Fear, that the Obama administration, we know Bush considered it, we know Clinton considered it, but the Obama administration also considered a first strike on North Korea. So it is the most sanctioned country in the world due to US-led sanctions, which have been draconian, that it has grinded humanitarian aid to a halt. I mean, nothing can virtually get into North Korea. And so this is a country where at least 40% of the population do not even have the basics to lead a life of dignity. And so, and the UN says that up to 60,000 North Korean children could starve as a result of sanctions. We saw what sanctions did to Iraq. Sanctions are doing that right now to North Koreans. So the unresolved war is the reason why millions of Korean families, they still remain divided and separated, unable to see and touch and embrace their loved ones. We must finish the job and finally end the longest standing US war. So many say, yeah, but many say, many say, thank you, I feel you. But many say, well, just let the Koreans do it. I mean, after all, both Koreas have been advancing peace at a breakneck pace. President Moon has been the key interlocutor between Washington and Pyongyang. In May, the day after Trump canceled his meeting with Kim, Moon met Kim and Pam Moon-jum. Actually, we were, Medea and a bunch of other women from around the world, we were marching in the DMZ, and we later learned that actually Kim and Moon were meeting in Pam Moon-jum. The day before, we had been protesting outside of the US Embassy and said, Moon, just pick up the phone. Who gives it about Trump? Just pick up the phone. The Korea peace train has left the station, and lo and behold, they were meeting and talking that following day. But yeah, so President Moon, he succeeded to get the talks happening in Singapore. He succeeded again this round in Pyongyang to now get the talks back between the US and North Korea but he can only keep the diplomatic rails on track for so long. And he is also doing his best to free South Korea from the yoke of US domination, especially under such a tempestuous, erratic, unpredictable US president. In his August 15th Liberation Day speech, President Moon declared, quote, we are the protagonists of the Korean Peninsula and developments in inter-Korean relations are not the by effects of progress in the relationship between the US and North Korea, but rather on inter-Korean peace. So he is doing his best. We need to support President Moon and South Korea. <laughs> and let's not forget, this is not just Korea's war. 
This is America's war. This is Canada's war. And the peace movement isn't just fighting those who want a new Korean war. We are taking on the military, industrial, think tank, media complex that benefits from this status quo. On June 12th, when President Trump shook hands with Kim Jong-un and signed the Singapore Declaration, where the two leaders agreed to four things. Yes, it was thin, but it was substantive. They agreed to improve relations. They agreed to establish a peace process. They agreed to denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and they agreed to repatriate the U.S. remains of the U.S. servicemen. Instead of cheering on this historic beginning, detractors ranging from the Washington blob to the corporate media to the so-called resistance Democrats who slammed prospects for peace, including introducing legislation restrict, restricting Trump from withdrawing U.S. troops from South Korea. That is our resistance in Congress. Oh my God, somebody please help me. Virtually every major media and pundit has blasted the Kim and Trump summit, and even after the groundbreaking Kim and Moon summit in Pyongyang. No wonder there is such an uproar. Defense stocks fell the day after Kim and Trump shook hands. Raytheon, Boeing, General Dynamics, and Lockheed Martin, they all took a hit. And according, according to one investment officer, quote, if weapons are used, they need to be replaced. That makes war a growth story for these stocks. And one of the big potential growth stories has been North Korea. How sick is that? North Korea is not going to give up its nuclear weapons without peace. Pyongyang has always, always called for a step-by-step -step approach, and they already made several concessions. It has halted missile and nuclear tests, began to dismantle nuclear missile sites, released three detained American prisoners, and have already repatriated the remains of U.S. servicemen from the Korean War. The U.S., they've halted the joint exercises with South Korea. They can be resumed tomorrow. So while the prospect of undoing 70 years of mistrust and propaganda seemed daunting and impenetrable, it isn't. The greatest enemy to peace is apathy and the belief that we can't overpower those wanting perpetual war. While there is so much uncertainty of how things will shake out in the US political system, which impacts the world, there is one constant. You, me, us, the movements for peace and justice fighting for the future of our world. It was the Korean War, after all, that inaugurated the Cold War and the military-industrial complex. According to the eminent Korea historian Bruce Cummings at the University of Chicago, quote, the Korean conflict was the occasion for transforming the U.S. into a very different country than it had ever been before. One with hundreds of permanent military bases abroad, a large standing army, and a permanent national security state at home." End quote. The Korean War, quote unquote, came along and saved us, end quote, said Dean Acheson, who was Tr Truman's Secretary of State. It quadrupled the defense budget, it militarized U.S. foreign policy, and it cemented the idea of the U.S as the world's policeman. And so that which has been erected by men can be brought down by women. <laughs> and we now know from decades of women's peace organizing, many in this room, the extraordinarily courageous Canadian American women we now know that when women are part of the peace building process, not only does it lead to an actual peace agreement, and when women help draft that agreement, it is far more durable. So the good news is Women Cross DMZ has formed a coalition with our Korean sisters. I hope to go to Beijing next month to meet with North Korean women. We're in the process of negotiating. So they could also be part of the campaign, but we have a network 
of South Korean women's peace organizations who have been with us, who have joined the campaign. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom are part of the campaign. The Nobel Women's Initiative and many of our sister organizations who have been on this journey with us across the DMZ, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, Code Pink. So we're launching this women-led Korea peace treaty campaign, the 2020 women-led peace treaty campaign. We're going to be mobilizing women globally to put pressure on the US, the UN, and key countries like Canada. We're going to see a peace agreement to end the Korean War. And we see all the organizations present in this room at the World Beyond War Conference to be key allies in this campaign. So thank you. Thank you for your commitment and belief that we must end all war and militarism everywhere. As the Korean people are showing us, there is no more time to hate, only time for love, for peace, and a brighter future for the people and our planet. Let us stand with Koreans and help the war and unite the Korean people. It is the just and moral thing to do, and we will have far more money to invest in things that give us real security. Now let me end with a short video about our historic journey across the DMC. Thank you. A group of prominent female activists is expected to cross the DMC into South Korea from the north next week. The 30 activists led by an eminent American feminist and two winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. The message, let there be peace in a divided land. These women talking about peace in white in the most militarized place on earth. We're specifically calling for the end to the Korean War. Hamunjom is the site where the armistice agreement was signed, and that's where we would like to cross. How would you address skeptics who say uh, you guys are naive or uh, uh, this could be used by North Korean government as uh, part of their propaganda? The past of no contact has not worked. Yeah. So we feel that it's important that we try reaching out, friendship, contact, walking, doing with our physical selves what we hope can be done politi politically. <laughs> We women from North and South Korea and around the world are walking to invite all concerned to begin a new chapter in Korean history. of this journey is to bring back the human dimension in this conflict where hearts have been broken, homes have been torn apart, families have been destroyed, and all we see on TV is the militarized portion of this war. it's going to be the outcome of the peace process but we're here to provide international solidarity to help heal the division A group 
of prominent female activists is expected to cross the DMZ into South Korea from the north next week. The 30 activists led by an eminent American feminist and two winners of the Nobel. Thank you, Christine. That was wonderful. War does indeed shape cultures. It poisons every aspect of our cultures. It militarizes our police. War and racism fuel each other. One of the organizations I, I know of with the best policy position on war uh, is not even thought of as a peace organization. It's Black Lives Matter, and the Black Lives Matter platform is excellent. Uh, Raven Wings is a member of the Black Lives Matter Toronto Steering Committee. She is an empowerment movement storyteller who aims to challenge mainstream arts and dance spaces by sharing her stories as a Tanzanian, Bermudian, queer, two-spirit, transcendent, Mohawk individual. Raven co-founded Il Nana Diverse City Dance Company. You can read her full bio in the program or on the website. Raven Wings, welcome to No War 2018. Hello, everyone. Um, bring this up. Is that better? You can hear me now? Okay. Great. Uh, I'm a little nervous. I'm not necessarily a speaker, I'm a dancer, so bear with me as I work through my nervousness to share this message with you. Um, thank you for this in, the introduction and for this entire conference. It's really beautiful um, to know that there are so many people who are um, dedicated to peace and um, changing the way that things operate on a day-to-day -day basis right now. Um, so again, I'm Raven Wings. Um, and the reason why I share that I'm Tanzanian, Bermudian, Mohawk, Two-Spirit, and Transcendent, Trans, um, is because I believe um, it's important to claim our identities in, in the space that we're in, um, in this time period of such uh, division, um, to bring us closer and to get us to know each other on a personal level, because I believe that um, you do more for people who you care about. Um, you fight for people who you care about, um, you listen and believe people who you care about. Um, and also, it's, a, it's an important way to identify um, our positions in life, our privileges and disadvantages, um, which I think is, you know, really, really important to raising our consciousness around humanity. Um, so I'm a person who, uh, that used to support from the safe zone. Um, I, had, uh, I felt like I had a really good reason to do so. Um, black, queer, trans, immigrant, I have very many reasons to keep myself safe and out of public um, spaces. Um, and I grew up idolizing like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Frederick Douglass, Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King. I also went to high school in Atlanta, so that's why it's very Atlanta-based. <laughs> um, and so um, growing up with those heroes, uh, I wanted to be a part of that. Um, however, growing up and being queer, um, I was told either to be queer, gay, or, um, or black, you couldn't be both. And so I chose myself. <laughs> and I thought that by um, choosing myself and choosing to invest in my own liberation, my, my love of my body and myself, my spirit, that it would um, transfer to my community somehow. Um, and I created Ilnana Diversity Dance Company with my husband and uh, best friend. And we created it because there wasn't a lot of representation uh, in Toronto that we felt like actually represented what was happening in Toronto, the amazing work of queer and marginalized artists in the city um, and the, the mirror that they were holding up to what was happening in communities here and globally. Um, and so we came together to really start to um, change the, land, the landscape of what people thought that dance and movement could do, what we could talk about. Um, and I believe we, we were really successful in doing that. Um, this brought me to 
Black Lives Matter. Um, this is why I did that circle. <laughs> um, so Black Lives Matter came to me and my company to do a flash mob event for the Take Back the Night um, action, which is an action that supports women and all folks who have um, survived um, sexual or physical abuse. Um, and it was at that event, and I hadn't known um, Black Lives Matter very personally, so it was at the event that I decided that I would learn more. And so I watched some interviews with them and, and noticed that I had two very different narratives happening the one that the media was was putting out and the one that I was hearing from them in person. Um, and so I was really trying to decipher if I wanted to be involved, how I wanted to be involved, um, because I was hearing things like radical, militant, uh, dangerous, aggressive. Um, but I didn't feel any of that when I was in spaces with, with, these, with some of these folks. Um, and I was really on the fence. I was on the fence because even in this space, I know where all the exits are. I know how to get myself out really, really quickly. It's just part of my life and what I've had to figure out. Um, and so I didn't want to be in positions where I was putting myself in danger. Um, however, I went to the Tent City Action, which was the action that Black Lives Matter Toronto held at the headquarters of the police. Um, and um, it, was, it was really shocking, really surprising. and. I didn't expect it. What happened in the space was really, really actually quite beautiful because there were so many communities, um, class backgrounds, street involved youth that were all in that, er in all in that um, small little area um, that came together that were listening to each other, sharing stories, um, singing songs, dancing, um, chanting, keeping each other warm because it was really cold, it was February. Um, and it was really quite beautiful um, in the midst of being in a very, very intense situation. So the first night that I was there, which was the Monday, because um, I, I was like, I'm not sleeping over. I'm not going to stay outside. I'm not about any of that. So uh, <laughs> I showed up in the evening to be like, just check it out. And um, they were playing a game, who's your favorite rapper? Um, and I was like, this is strange. I don't expect this from an action or a rally. Um, yeah, they're just playing this game. And so after the game, uh, right after the game, the police officers came out and um, in these yellow raincoats and they filled the, the whole entire stairs and created this formation that I felt like I had only seen in like videos of watching Martin Luther King back in the day. Um, and so I was like really surprised that this was happening like in Toronto. Um, and so I was like, okay, this is weird, but it feels like a standoff. Um, and they were like, you have to go. Um, the leader at the t of the time at the, of the BLM movement was like, we're not gonna go. We're allowed to stay here as a public space. We're allowed to peacefully protest. We're here protesting the death of Andrew Loku. Um, and so we were giving advice and not advice, but we were telling them the story of what happened to Andrew Loku and how we were a community of people who cared and we're gonna be here. Um, for his, for to get the attention of the police chief and uh, Kathleen Wynn, the premier at that time. Um, and so what ended up happening was that the police uh, descended on, into us a bit and just knocked everyone down from like elders to children to just everyone was like flat on the floor. Um, and what was terrifying to me was that they looked terrified. Um, to me, that, that, that showed me that there was something like re really, really deep within them that taught them that they were supposed to fear us. Um, and that this was larger than just the police who were in front of me. There was a whole system involved um, that I wasn't aware of, or at least I didn't let myself be aware of. Um, so um, the moment that changed my life when I, when I moved off the fence and I jumped in, was a young girl, um, about four or five years old. Her mother uh, was pinned down and she was screaming. She screamed that the police officer let her mother go and the police officer looked at her, rolled his fist and punched her in the arm. Um, and I was, and this was a young, uh, young white girl and I was shocked. And the scream that came out of her, I was like, there was no way I can pretend or act as if I'm not involved anymore. Um, I can't go on with my life and dance in my studio and not um, come out here and figure out how I, I can support. 
and I didn't know how. I didn't have all the language and all that stuff going on. Um, and so um, I came and I taught dance in the space. I taught people um, some yoga movements and all the things that I used to, to reduce harm in my own body because I believe trauma just lives really closely tight inside our bodies. Um, and so that's what I was doing. And eventually I was asked to join uh, Black Lives Matter Toronto. Um, so I want to give a little bit of information on Black Lives Matter Toronto because I feel like there's so much misinformation that any time I get an opportunity to talk about who we are and what we want, um, I, I jump at that. So um, Black Lives Matter began as a love letter to Black people after the verdict of um, the George Zimmerman acquittal um, of the Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin case. Um, and it brought about a, a, a sense of um, like a call and response and action. So the call was that we needed to come together and figure out a way to protect um, black people and black communities globally. 2015. Um, but to be clear, this was happening before 2015. <laughs> um, so um, this was just like a very publicized case. Um, and so um, we felt like it was important to come together and figure out how we support. Um, when, I, when I was looking at some of the ways that BLM Toronto started, um, at first it was just as allies to what was happening in the States. And then we started to realize that these things were happening right here in Toronto, in Mississauga, in Durham, all around. And that there needs to be a group here that was uplifting and holding uh, the police accountable and also um, building up um, building up uh, political education for our communities um, so they knew what their rights were. Um, all that being said, I believe um, that by doing this work, we also really, really focus on our relationship to Indigenous people. Um, as, um, as you know, we gather on the land of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, like it's really important that we uh, acknowledge the genocide here that continues here um, and remember like what happened and what is happening with this water crisis that's still happening right now um, and all the ways that we can support um, folks here who um, are the natural um, and original peoples of this land. Um, and as BLM Toronto, we, we are really, really dedicated to having a very strong relationship um, with movements that are about um, change and liberation and uh, freedom. Um, but I also feel like it's important that even though we're talking about um, destabilizing um, war, um, that we also talk about ways to uh, generate hope and possibility um, using creative activism. And the way that Black Lives Matter Toronto does that is um, we created Black, uh, the Freedom School. So the Freedom School is a program for ages four to 11 where student, for little students and kids um, learn about who they are, learn about the history of Black Canadians and what they've done here as opposed to just Martin Luther King one, uh, one day of the month in February. Um, and just really teach them about like integrity and principle and how to relate to each other, um, how to um, speak to adults, how to have uh, confidence within themselves, because we believe in raising children to be leaders, um, because that's what we're trying to leave behind. Um, so there's a story that I want to share with you um, that I feel when, when I heard it, it, it really broke my heart and, and paints a really important picture of the state of um, black life here in Canada. So um, I don't know how many of you know the story of Mark Ikamba, um, a, a young man, 19 years old, um, who was murdered in uh, Mississauga. So the story goes like this. Um, there was a disturbance, um, so the, the police were called and um, they showed up to his place. He showed up uh, to the door wearing shorts, no shirt and no shoes, um, and they asked him to come outside. He said, why? Um, they didn't answer. They said, come outside. He also, he was like, no, I don't have to. I don't know what's going on. You have to give me a reason, and they pulled him out. 
So they dragged him out. There were two officers um, who dragged him out of the house. Um, his mother, who didn't speak much English, um, grabbed her pen because she didn't understand what was happening and freed her son. Um, he then ran away, ran down the block, um, and the officers proceeded to arrest his mother. Um, his mother um, um, was really, really confused, was really out of, like, didn't know what was really happening. And when he saw his mother being arrested, he came back. On his way back, he was shot at 19 times. <laughs> And, um, whew, sorry. Um, and five of the bullets hit other officers. Um, and one bullet, the only story that came out of this was this one bullet that went into a neighbor's house, a woman who was cutting her vegetables, and hit her in the spine. She is, she is now paralyzed. Um, that is the story that went into the news. There was a disturbance, and a woman was paralyzed in the in the altercation, but you didn't hear about the young man who was shot at 19 times or his mother who was given no information about him after they took his body from the scene. Um, so his, so it gets worse. <laughs> his sister, um, about a week or two later, his, um, a friend saw the story because BLM found out and then we put it out. We stopped traffic in the highway and we were like, people need to pay attention to what's happening here. Um, and and this, his sister saw what happened um, and tried to find him. And the police gave her the runaround for about two weeks. Um, she was asking where her brother was, and she found out after two weeks that they had already buried him. They had already buried him. So um, his family was given no um, choice in where he was laid to rest. Um, and they were very scared about coming to us and having us um, sort of elevate the story so that many people would hear um, what had happened. Um, and so it took a while um, for us to get any major response. Um, but this is one of the stories, one of the many stories that happened just in Mississauga. And so for me, um, it, I felt like it was really important to, to share that story with you to let you know of the kind of um, treatment that is happening all around us, not being reported by our police and law enforcement, and how it, how it represents an important um, need that we have to disarm the police. Um, I don't know if people think that that's um, strange to think about disarming the police. Um, this is what I've heard. Uh, it's not possible. But there are places and countries in the world that have disarmed the police, and there has been more peace in that area and more relationships formed between the police and um, the communities um, in those countries. And uh, it's just a matter of if you want to change. Um, a lot of people um, like, like the thought of peace and reconciliation in theory. Um, but when it comes to actually being active and making things happen, um, and you realize that you may lose some of your privileges, it, it starts to um, make people teeter off a little bit. And so um, I shared that personal story of myself because um, I think um, I could come up here and leave like stats and policies and all those things, but what I really want to leave you with is um, a, a sense of... of urgency and um, a need for us to really figure out ways to support all communities that are oppressed and marginalized. And I believe in uh, trans feminism and the, the act of allowing the folks who are the most marginalized or affected by um, something to be the people who are leading it. So to support as much as we can. But we're all affected by war, the generations of war. Um, and so I'm interested in figuring out how we destabilize war, how we bring the money out of war, because that's really what it is. People don't want peace because it doesn't bring money. Um, <laughs> and so um, I, I've been, I've been, I was wrestling a little bit with what to share. Um, yeah, I was just, I was kind of like, um, do, do I say 
that I'm a person who believes in vengeance, kind of, but then I also don't think that um, vengeance is, is actually useful. Um, I don't believe that that is actually what's gonna make things shift. In a moment, it might make you feel satisfied, um, but really I, I want a huge um, heart shift, actually. Um, a place where we can um, listen to each other and listen to stories from all around the world. And, and so how can I help that? What can I do? More so than like sharing, <laughs> sharing uh, say her name or say his name hashtag, but um, an actual like showing up and voting and showing up and um, calling out um, the white supremacist um, governments in the ways that um, the government is continuing to terrorize indigenous communities in, in Vancouver and, and starting to drill on their grave sites. Um, I don't think any of us would allow that, <laughs> um, but it's happening now. Um, and so these are things that I want us to also sort of be aware of as we're talking about Korea and the United States. We also need to be talking about Canada and what's happening here and what has happened um, here and how to hold um, <laughs> the Ford person uh, accountable uh, for everything that he's taking away from everyone. I think people thought, oh, he was gonna come and do some conservative stuff, but he's literally taking things from every single person. And I think um, people are starting to recognize that and we need to get him out. However we need to do that, we just need to get him out of office um, and start to have a government that reflects um, the people in this room the people who are about change and peace and revolution and um, creating new ways and pathways to um, survive um, the generations of, of pain. So what I wanna leave with you is one quote. Um, it's a quote that means a lot to us at BLMTO. Um, it's what we say before and after our actions to remind us of our principles and um, why we fight because it can be um, tiring and exhausting um, and dangerous. Um, and so it goes like this, it's from Asada Shakur. Um, it is our duty to fight for our freedom and it is our duty to win. We must love one another and support each other for we have nothing to lose but our chains. Simple, but, um, but if, but if adapted, shifts everything. So thank you for listening. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, Paki and Donald are gonna come take a couple of microphones and go to the aisles and look for people holding up their hands who look like they have really good questions. And yeah, we, we have maybe 20 minutes. Test, 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 Hello. Please, please. Okay, David, we got okay, the mics. If I, if I see somebody, but we're good. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, I, I'm Peter from Syracuse. And Christine, I'm glad you forgot your passport. And I think the people up on the screen forgot their passports. I think, Ms. Raven, you forgot your passport. And I think we should all forget our passports. <laughs> but my question is about people who have been trying to to make peace happen and one little little part of this history that I would like to to hear more about from you is what William Perry did back in about 1994 or so when he flew into Pyongyang who flies into Pyongyang right and he was able to work with North Korea on this agreed upon framework and he had it all done I heard this from him a couple of years ago. He gave a, a talk about it. And what do you think about why and how that was 
that agreed upon framework that was all done, got undone by the next administration. And, and, and as you said, it isn't just Trump that's trying to undo this. This is something that's ongoing, right? Can you say a little more about that history, please? Sure. I mean, I would say that um, borrowing from the words of Robert Carlin, who was in the, um, in the State Department, Bush killed the agreement, basically. Yes, um, Bush, the Bush administration killed the agreed framework. And so the agreed framework was negotiated during um, the Clinton administration. The Clinton, um, had, they were a new administration. And they found out that North Korea had actually been processing um, plutonium at this Yongbyon um, facility. And they gathered in the um, Oval Office, and they were going to basically launch a first strike. And it was actually Jimmy Carter. He like knew about this and because the Korean Americans, especially the faith community, had been really engaging with Jimmy Carter, he flew with a CNN camera crew and he got on a boat with Kim Il-sung and they negotiated the terms of the agreed framework and North Korea agreed to freeze their nuclear weapons program. So that was a success in diplomacy. But what failed was they, you know, the U.S. had promised that in exchange for North Korea doing that, and North Korea's excuse was, we're also doing it for energy. And most people don't realize that the famine that took place in North Korea in the mid-1990s, where almost a million people perished in a famine, is because of an energy crisis. So actually, North Korea is the canary in the coal mine in terms of climate change. I mean, North Korea was so dependent on the former Soviet Union for petroleum. They had it not just to run the tractors or heat their homes or light their houses. They used it in fertilizer. They had a very advanced industrial agricultural system. I mean, the Green Revolution, it was taking place in North Korea. So um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, all that came, you know, and so North Korea was in an economic crisis. So between the economic crisis, the political crisis, Kim Il-sung died, who emerged after the end of the Cold War as the sole superpower, the United States, the greatest enemy against North Korea. So North Korea was basically shit out of luck. I mean, it was like bad times for North Korea. And so, um, so yes, the agreed framework, the perception from the US was this is a country that is unstable. The regime is going to collapse. And so they actually never followed through on their commitment to, to build the two light water reactors that was it promised as an exchange. Um, they were promised heavy shipments of fuel. That was very on and off. So I mean, I think we can play, place a lot of blame on North Korea, but that is not true. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that when we look at the current situation and we say, they, they can't be trusted. Well, from the North Korean side, they'd say, the U.S., they are not even-handed. They don't play clean. And so, um, so I think we just need to know that history. So thank you for bringing up that Bill Perry thing. And, but I think what's great about Bill Perry, he has come around from the dark side, you know. Um, and I think he has been a very ardent advocate, not only for uh, the abolishment of nuclear weapons, but for peace. And, you know, he almost, I mean, that's what's so crazy to me is when Clinton almost left the White House, he had, they had learned the hard lesson about North Korea. It's not going to be collapsing anytime soon, so we need to negotiate. They almost negotiated uh, the end of, uh, like, basically the, the beginnings of a peace agreement. And when Bush came into office, that was done. So that's why, again, I think um, James Laney, who was the ambassador during the Clinton administration, has a brilliant quote. And he basically says, when there is just a ceasefire in place, and when there isn't a formal resolution of the war, each side will always question, and it's always going to be devil the talks. We need to transform the armistice into a peace treaty. So I think that is our job as a peace movement. We can do this. The Koreans are aligned to do this. Let's back them and get this done. Yeah. All right. Should we go to the next question? Yes, Anne, go ahead. Uh, Christine, could you talk about how important it is for the international community to really jump on this peace treaty 
2020. And in particular, U.S. citizens can't go to, the, to North Korea right now, but can Canadian citizens go and see for themselves strides that are being made on economic sides? Thank you. I think you have answered your own question, Anne Wright. Um, yes, the U.S., uh, and, you know, after the unfortunate um, death of uh, Warmbier, Otto Warmbier, the, the college student from the um, University of Virginia, died in North Korea. And I think that, you know, that was a very tragic situation. Obviously, he was expo experienced some kind of very serious um, duress. But, you know, a lot of the medical examiners that saw his body said, this man, this man was not tortured. I mean, he, might, he obviously experienced emotional torture by being detained and imprisoned. But um, because of that incident, the U.S. put forth a travel ban on Americans going to North Korea. So we have to fight that. So those of us in the U.S., we have to fight that. Um, but Canadians can go. And actually, you know, I have come to Canada um, on a number of occasions, we organized a big action in Vancouver uh, when, the, uh, when um, Fr Christopher Freeland organized with then Rex Tillerson a forum. And we said, no, these are all the countries that fought in the Korean War. You are not about making peace. And your version of peace is called maximum pressure. That is not peace. Mm -hmm. You know, like cutting off diplomatic ties, forcing other countries to cut off diplomatic ties with North Korea. Um, doing like aggressive military posturing, this is not diplomacy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think that Canadians, like my hope is that Canadians can move the needle on um, Canada's position. Canada has been way too cozy up oh, yeah. with the Trump administration about oh. this maximum pressure. You guys can all put a little pressure on Canada. Canada purports to be this like peace loving country. Well, you know, the stuff that I see coming out of Canada, it really should change its policy. And Canada does have a responsibility in the Korean War. You all, as we all, as from countries that fought in that war, we have our responsibility to end it. Do we have a question for Raven? Do we have a question for Raven? Yes, over there. Yeah, I do. Yeah, oh, please go ahead then. Rose Dice in Toronto. Uh, Raven, uh, thank you very much for oh, the please. account of what uh, uh, drew you into the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, I just want to, uh, you to clarify uh, what you experienced uh, when you were involved in that rally or whatever it was, uh, um, a rap music mm -hmm. festival in February, uh, and when you found a, a swarm of policemen descending on you. Uh, did I understand you correctly to say that they were just as frightened as you were? Yes. Um, if, when you looked in their, when I looked in their faces, mm -hmm. um, they looked terrified. They were. Um, they were. Yeah. Uh, they as were, well as they you. were. The, they were the aggressors, mm -hmm. but they were terrified. And so, um, the question I had was, who gave that order? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. O okay. Now, uh, my second uh, or the other part of my question is, um, you know, that uh, there's been a lot of shootings in Toronto. We're way over yes. what uh, yes. uh, occurred uh, yes. uh, for the entire year last year, and uh, there has been uh, quite a, a push. Uh, both at the federal level and municipal level here in Toronto to get um, a ban on guns in urban communities. Uh, d does your organization support that? Um, I support banning guns in all communities, to be honest. <laughs> um, I think, like, I think the focus on urban communities having, having more guns um, is actually quite false. Guns are everywhere. Um, and I think that just because you ban them in one area and they're in another, it doesn't mean they won't get to where they need to get I to. I agree so, with you, but yeah. are you going to support the federal and municipal initiatives on this? Um, so I'm speaking as an individual at this moment. Um, as, as, a, as a group, as a group, um, we support anything that brings peace to communities, right? However, I think that we are tired um, of, how do I say this? Um, tired of 
um, white supremacist organizations creating problems in our communities and then trying to create ways to fix it and create more problems. So like one example of that is the carding initiative. Um, or they're now called police checks. Um, so that is, is a direct sort of way to um, leak, like carding and is a way of police officers coming up to you being like, hey, what is your name? It can be as simple as that. Your name, mostly, mostly black and brown folks in those communities um, where you can be walking home and they'll ask you why you're going home at night. And the, and the law is that you don't actually have to answer that question. Um, but because of intimidation, um, we give our names, we give all our information. We're like, this person's not going to hurt me. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to do everything the right way. Um, and we're still attacked and we're still sort of vilified. But how it works, <laughs> the system of how it works is if you are carded, then your name goes into a system. Um, and then when you are murdered, the media will say they had run-ins with the police. Right? And so that's how those police checks work out. And, and then the media uses them to keep this cycle going where um, these communities, urban communities, um, are, are, are touted as more violent than others. And I don't believe that's the case. We have another question uh, way up there. Yes, sir, with the microphone. Uh, I think by any estimate, Trump is right on Korea. How come there's so little support among the peace movement for Trump? Like even yourself, with all due respect, not calling out in support of Trump on Korea. I just, I just find the silence curious. Um, about supporting the president. Yeah. Well, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, he's doing, this is the one sweet spot in terms of what the Trump administration is doing. And it's just... But how is it complicated? It's not complicated for me. I just think that the way that uh, it is, I mean, you're dealing with two people. I mean, Trump and Kim perhaps are the two most vilified um, world leaders. And so when you bring, uh, I think that we need to be putting forward uh, a message that peace and diplomacy, no matter who it is, is a good step. Yeah, I know I agree with you. Well, so somebody else can definitely answer that. Yeah. I just think that, well, I can just speak from the U.S. perspective. His, yeah, his question so, is, how come the peace movement is silent on supporting Trump for doing this, taking this step? of uh, pursuing diplomacy with North Korea. And I would agree with you that that is also our frustration. That is my frustration. And I have been on television and I've said, this is the one sweet spot in the Trump administration. We should applaud for him for doing it. But I think that there is, um, especially among the democratic uh, establishment and, and liberals, I would say, first of all, there's so much misinformation about North Korea. And so the way that I, in my experience of being on like TV with quote unquote liberals is that uh, how dare um, Trump meet with somebody like Kim Jong-un while he trashes relationships with Canada and France and, yeah. and yada, yada, yada. And I think that that framing is not right because I, I am in okay. agreement okay. with we, you. We have other questions yeah. and four yeah. minutes left. Can I, yeah. so, can I offer yes, something? Yes, Raven, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to offer something. Um, Trump isn't so trustworthy, right? And so when you're looking at someone's character, you have to look at everything that they've done. Yes, one thing can be awesome, but you have to look at the entire track record. He has flip-flopped on every single thing that he promised, even to his own base. And so you have to be a little bit more careful about jumping into support for someone who switches the moment someone mm -hmm. else says, hey, I like what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, <laughs> like, I think that caution and caution and patience is necessary. I get that we are in urgent time, but I don't think we can just make hasty decisions just because 
things are happening. Maybe we can support so, good actions and oppose yeah. bad actions and leave yeah. entire yeah. persons out of it. Mm -hmm. We have three minutes to go. We have a question right here in the well, front. You two are phenomenal speakers, and I thank David for bringing you. It's just so fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'm Arthur Canagas, director of the film The World is My Country. And my question, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And my question for you is, uh, you both talked about the kind of destructive role of the media in all this, and people talk about the destructive role of governments and protesting that. Uh, what levers do we have to begin to shift the way the media is handling these two crucial issues? What, as, as citizens, how can we begin to, you know, I don't know, do campaigns that catch, call the media when they're doing something wrong on this and bring to attention or do something to begin to impact the way the media is covering both these stories? Um, personally, I would say that some of that work has already begun, but it's not at a, at a, at a, at a level yet that it's permeated bigger sort of circles. So folks have started their own sort of radio shows, blogs, um, Twitter yeah, Twitter verses, all, all these different ways because the way that we communicate now is so different. Um, and so a lot of folks um, are usually like watching what's on their phone. And so um, podcasts and things like that, I think are, are discussing the way that the media is a part of this, this system. Um, we at BLM understand that the media is many things to us. On one, on one side, we use the media to get our messages out. Um, however, we understand that the media will misconstrue what we say. And so um, part of it is that there's only there's a select group of people that will only watch the media. So we can't just ignore that space of things that are happening. And so we do as much as we can to like balance it out with all of the information that we try and throw. That's why we come to these things to make sure that people are hearing what else is what else is happening. Um, but the media it's it's hard to hold them accountable due to like free speech and all that stuff that's going on. So. Um, we got to figure out my race. Yeah. yeah. 30 seconds left. We want to go to Matias' question. Yeah, Matias, go for it. Well, it was uh, actually to follow up on, isn't Trump a bit um, erratic in that he canceled Mike Pompeo's trip to Korea? He brought uh, Russia to task at the UN for violating sanctions. He's constantly on, on Korea, uh, China's case around that. And what do you think might happen in, next week at the UN? Well... I mean, based on what we heard, um, well, we saw Trump's retweet, but this is very exciting. And, uh, and we saw a statement from the State Department saying that they look forward to dialogue with North Korea. But I, I'm worried, frankly, I'm worried that uh, the U.S. is not going to really seriously take a peace process with North Korea. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. I, my sense is we just don't have enough... Um, political will and organizing. And so that's why I come to places like this to ask for your solidarity and support. So our, uh, our, our, first, our first big plenary is coming up now, right after this. Uh, thank you to these two wonderful speakers. Thank you.